name is Dietrich von Segern. It's about text and fonts in PDF and subtitle is what has PDF 2.0 not changed for font encoding. So just to say it uh, straightforward in the beginning. So in fact, there not much has changed in this area in PDF 2.0. So who is expecting to learn about uh, lots of new stuff about font encoding and so um, this is not going to happen in this session, just to be clear about that. So anyway, uh, what I want to do instead is um, I want to look how fonts, how text, so what actually happens in a PDF renderer when it displays text, such as you can see here on the screen. Um, so what is, what is actually happening there behind the scenes in order to just write this text on the screen and I thought um, since um, I know many of you are working with PDFA for archiving and PDFA also has uh, requirements for PDFA uh, for, for fonts, I thought maybe it's a good idea to just start with explaining uh, or with, we're looking into what requirements we have in PDFA and maybe take that as a starting point for some explanations. So that is going to be the starting point. Then uh, second is uh, then we will um, dive deeper into what actually uh, does the PDF specification say uh, about fonts and encoding and text? And then, yes, um, there are some changes. We want to look into that. So what has changed in PDF 2.0 compared to previous versions of PDF? And then finally, I have a few examples of problems um, when um, a PDF is not properly rendered. When it for for text and fonts. So okay, and then starting point again. We are here in in PDFA, and what I have done is um, I've opened the preflight tool in Adobe Acrobat uh, that takes care of all uh, PDFA conversions and PDFA validation. So I opened that tool because I know that very well. The tool. And um, I have just searched for all checks that have to do with text and font. Um, and I just I thought about each of this check, each of these strings that are being displayed when a certain problem is present in the PDF file. So when the PDFA validation engine thinks some something does not comply to PDFA, I was looking at the error messages that could potentially show up and I was looking at just words there where I think, okay, that, is, that might not be clear for everybody what that actually means. And then I've highlighted these text strings, these words in red. So there is a not def glyph in the first line. We have a char set in the second or a CID, identity age or V encoding, we have a CMAP, a CID set, a symbolic two type font. You can follow, or you don't have to, so whatever. I'm just reading aloud what is uh, what messages may occur in preflight Adobe Acrobat, where I think, okay, that, that might confuse users. And I have just picked one tool, preflight and Adobe Acrobat. Um, Boris provided me with similar strings, so that, that is just a link over there, just uh, for the sake of, of completeness. So these words here, they are not uh, specific to preflight, of course. They are words that are coming from font technology and from uh, a PDF specification technology. And you will find similar strings over there for Vera PDF, for, for another PDF validation engine, and I'm pretty sure you will find uh, pretty much the same words over there uh, as well. So, and then I've used this word and then I've just ask some questions. So what is a glyph? What is a not def glyph? What is a char set? What is a CID set? What actually is identity age or identity V encoding? What is a font encoding? What is a CMAP? And if we have a CMAP with a capital C and a capital M at the beginning, is it the same as a CMAP with lowercase letters? 
uh, what is the difference as array, what is the type 2 CID font, what is the CID to GID map, and what is width information. So all this information, all these words are used in pre-flights error messages when it comes to PDFA, but again, you will also find that in other um, validators. Another question is, why is it important whether a font is symbolic and what actually does that mean and how are fonts embedded into PDF? So, and that is basically, uh, at least for uh, the first part of this presentation, what I'm going to talk about. And then, um, somebody already knows that, so it's fine. Um, giving first answers, um, because the, these are quite fundamental. Um, first, a glyph is a shape of a character. So, and I have used here another tool of preflight, which uh, if you open the options menu, you can see that here on the light, light uh, right, uh, left-hand side and open browse internal structure of all document fonts, uh, then you will see a tool and that tool basically on the left-hand side shows you GIDs with numbers and then when you click on a GID as here uh, GID 52, you can see that uh, that actually is a C. So and that C, the, the not just any C but this uh, uh, actual shape, exactly this shape uh, that you can see there, that is a glyph that is also associated with the character C in this particular font. And uh, in the same viewer you can go to GID0 and that shows this box over there on the right hand side and that is the not def. So every font on earth should have uh, a certain a glyph that is a fallback glyph. So when for whatever reason um, a viewer application can't find a proper glyph for a character code in the page description, then it should fall back to this glyph. And then you will see lots of boxes or at least one box where for instance a German umlaut couldn't be found in the font and then instead this box is being displayed. And the name for that is not def. And uh, the, while we are at it, at it, the GID here is an abbreviation for a glyph ID and since we are having a two type font here, uh, the, uh, uh, the glyphs are uh, in, uh, can be found in the font by means of this glyph ID. Okay? Yeah, anyway, if, if you have, if, if I'm not clear enough with regard to anything, just, just let me know, raise your hand, so I, I try to answer. Okay, so that was a kind of introduction where I'm coming from. So I'm coming from PDFA, or first for short answers. Now a more, more thorough analysis or description of what actually happens when text is being displayed. And, and how a PDF file uh, is internally constructed. constructed. So first, uh, the, the page description. So when one character is aligned after the other, uh, the page description loads a font object. So the PDF has a font object and this font object has just an internal name. In this example here, it's F25. Um, and at the same time, so the, the, the F25 font is established and the, the text size, which is 12 in this case, is set and then the font is loaded. And from then on, this font is specified to be used for every text that is used until another font is loaded. And the, the, this font resource, this F25 object, has some information like the base name of the thing, for, insta for example, courier, what font type that is, two type, the glyph bounding box, uh, the character widths, so the widths of the um, glyphs. 
and it might have uh, the font file. So either the font is embedded or it's not embedded. And as you all know, for PDFA and for PDFX, they have to be embedded. And if so, there is a font, there's an entry, for instance, a font file two in this example. And that basically is the whole font file. And what is important to understand when you want to understand font problems is that this font file doesn't have to do anything with the PDF specification. So this is just a data stream and the data stream could be a type 1 font, a two type font or whatever. And PDF just says, okay, you can use this or that uh, uh, font type there, but it doesn't say how, how that font file is being encoded. And then you have uh, width entries there in, uh, in the font file. So in the font file, that, that is another source of problem in PDFA. Uh, you have uh, here uh, the, the, the character widths in the PDF file. And if the font is embedded, you have another entry. The font file itself also has width information. And if you have two sources of information, what can happen, they, they, they are not always in sync. So you could have the problem that for the same uh, glyph, for the same character, you have two different entries for, for their widths. And therefore, PDFA has the requirements that these two widths entries match. And then finally, uh, there could be a two Unicode table. And a two Unicode table in the font, and I will, uh, not in the font, in the PDF, and I will get back to, yeah, to that later on. So again, a tool here from Acrobat Preflight. Now it's browse internal PDF structure. So now, before we were looking at the font, now we are looking at the PDF. And really important is, and many users don't know that, really important is um, when it comes to, to font information, you always, in PDF, you always have to be aware that you have a PDF part of that information. And that is information that you can see here. Uh, you have the PDF part of the information. And then, if the font is embedded, you in addition have the actual font file. So these are, and these are two different formats. The font file in this example, pre before we had two type, here we have a type one file. So these are uh, formatted according to their own specification, type one, type two, or whatever. And the PDF part, that in PDF is of course always encoded with, uh, according to the, or should be encoded according to the PDF specification. So, and then um, just to summarize what I have said before, I have uh, just here the, the information that I was mentioning beforehand. And then you can use the, what uh, this tool from Preflight shows you, browse internal PDF structure. So maybe you have a certain problem, you have some knowledge about PDF, then you can use that tool in order to identify and to find out what information actually is in your PDF file. And then you can see that uh, here I have my font objects, which is called TI1 in this case. Uh, and this TI1 object, this resource in PDF, it, it internally says that its base font name actually is some characters plus a real font name, which is Quadrat Sans Bold in this case. It tells me about the encoding. So you have encoding basically as a mapping from uh, ID. So in the page description, you just have a number and the number is associated with a character by, by means of an encoding. And you can in PDF have different encodings, and in this example, uh, the PDF is set up to use MacRoman encoding. And what else? Uh, here you have the font type. As, as I've said before, here you have the font bounding box. Uh, that is uh, the, the, the box, the biggest box that in, into which you can, you could uh, um, uh, uh, place all the glyphs in the, in the font. 
the character widths are over here, so the widths of each of the characters, of each of the glyphs. And as I've said in this example here, we have the font embedded, which is a type one font. We have learned in the very morning today uh, that was a, a font format that was developed and published by Adobe. Actually, it wasn't published in the beginning, but we have learned Adobe decided to do afterwards, otherwise afterwards. And uh, we have type one here, and but you could as well have two type as developed by um, Apple and Microsoft. And then, as I've said before, but it's not the case here, you could also have it to Unicode table. So this is what I said before, all the information that is needed in order to um, actually find uh, a certain glyph in order to display it on screen. Uh, all the information that is needed, I, I wanted to show to you, okay, this is a tool. There are, of course, there are many, many other tools that could do that as well. But there are tools that really allow you to look into the internal PDF structure. And who wants to understand fonts better, um, he has to use uh, such tools. Okay, now, um, now we've learned a little bit about the infrastructure, so what actually is there, and now the question is, okay, what, what now, how does the engine work? How does the engine have to work in order to find out which glyph has to be taken out of the font and put onto the screen? Each page in a PDF file has a page description, the content stream. And the content stream is just a number of objects. Here, this is a PDF file, so a red line and a gray line. And of course, in most cases, also text. And wherever text appears, the page description just have numbers. It has just codes uh, and one code after the other. Um, now, as I've said before, in order to get from the code to a glyph, you need a mapping, and that mapping is called the encoding. Um, and in PDF you can have, and that is a real complicated thing here, and that uh, creates many problems, you can have various ways to specify what encoding you want to use, and you can have standard encoding, but you can also have custom encoding. So this mapping is, I think, the most complex part of the whole form thing, and if it's complex, also the most error prone. Anyway, so mapping could take place either explicitly by, uh, uh, um, by an explicit encoding entry in the PDF structure or a CMAP entry or implicitly, implicitly in this context means in the font. So if there is no encoding entry and there is no CMAP entry in the PDF, then uh, use the encoding as present in the font. If there is an encoding entry, ignore the encoding entry in the font and use the one in the PDF file instead. And then after this complex thing has happened, then you actually have the glyph and then the rest is easy. Just take the glyph and put it on the, onto the screen and then um, do so for the next character code. Yeah, and then while we are at it, so if you do that for the next character code, you need to take the width entry into account. So then you just place the next glyph where the previous glyph ended. So therefore, you just you need the width entry um, for each glyph. So a few examples, and I really this information here is not there that you yet that you would remember it, but I, I mean. You can if you're if you're a developer, but um, it's just to show how complex that actually is or can be. So, for instance, for a Type One font, we might have a character code. So, all of these examples start with a character code. Then we have uh, in the PDF file there is a specification that MacRoman encoding should be used. That says why it's a table, so you find the table in the PDF specification as well. And that tells you for this character code, 
whatever, 20, um, there are the, 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 the glyph associated with this, it's a space. Um, so um, then you have a name for this thing, which is space in this case, or another uh, small letter C or whatever. Uh, so then you have the glyph name, and since you are t uh, in a type one font, Inside of the font you have glyph names, so actually you are already there. You know it's a, a lower letter C. You take that out of the font and you're done. With two types, this is usually more complicated because true type has been designed to serve uh, different environments. So it has been invented by Apple, Apple and Microsoft together. So inside of a true type font you can have more than just one encoding. Uh, and it has to be specified from outside which one to use. So in this example you have a character code and then you have a differences array which means uh, some custom encoding takes place so it's different from standards. So you, you go into the differences table, find uh, uh, a, a, a postscript glyph name there, uh, then you have the glyph name, but since you're in true type, you're not there yet because in true type you have GIDs, IDs, no glyph names. So then what you need to do is you go into the Adobe glyph list, uh, then the Adobe glyph list maps from uh, glyph names to Unicode code points, so then you have a Unicode code point, and then if the true type font has a C map, here we, we have the the C map with lower letter uh, uh, characters. Uh, you have the C map in a true type font, and then from there you can go to the glyph ID. So I wanted to clarify this. So this C map here is part of the internals of a true type font. The C map with smaller case letters, while the C map with a capital C and a capital M is something that you will find inside of the PDF structure. So they, it's not a, uh, they, 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 didn't, they haven't been spelled wrong when either the one or the other was mentioned in preflight. Okay, and the last one is, is rather easy again. So we have lots of identity here, which means we have a mapping, but actually what comes in goes, just goes out. So we have a character code. The C map, as I've said before, the mapping for CID fonts just says identity age, which means uh, if it's a horizontal, uh, uh, if the glyph is horizontal, if the, if the language is horizontal, just um, uh, use the character code. So the character code is translated one to one and the same into the next mapping, which is called CID to GID map. And so in this example, the actual character code is the same as the glyph ID in the font. Okay. So I think that that was the most complicated part and um, yeah. What, what is important too is to understand that in a PDF file you have, when, whenever you embed a font, you can have uh, various kinds of fonts. So as I've said before, you have, I mean, I think most of you know you have a two type font uh, format and the type one font format, uh, but there are also others like type three, which uh, instead of having outlines allows you to uh, use PDF code for your glyphs. Um, but uh, type three usually is used for, I don't know, custom font-like objects. So what you find in real world still is type one from Adobe, is true type or uh, composite fonts, which are uh, addressing an issue that you have with the simple fonts. The simple fonts can, two type and type one can only address 256 bytes, which is far enough for everyone using Latin char characters, but it's not enough if you're in Asia, so you have easily more than 25 glyphs. And in order to address that issue, um, composite fonts or CID fonts have been invented. But internally, CID, at least in PDF, internally these double byte fonts again fall back to structures that are similar to type 1 or 2 type. 
And then in PDF, you frequently have a uh, deviation of type 1, which is called CFF. That means compact font format. And I've said before, type 1 uses font names uh, and PostScript code. And CFF just uses abbreviations of these code in order to make the font more compact. But in the end, uh, it's it's at least somewhat easy in the end, everything falls back to type one-like structures and two type-like structures. So every font object in the end is at, at least like these basic font specifications. One more word to true type because this is uh, really also a, a frequent uh, case of, of headaches when it comes to fonts because true type is just more complex than type 1 fonts are. Um, as I've said before, a true type font can have various encodings embedded, which, is, which are called CMAPs. Um, and yeah, and then another issue is a two-type font can have a flag uh, that says uh, this font license does not allow for embedding. So other than um, type one fonts, a two-type font in its uh, font in its uh, data structures may specify I may not be embedded when a PDF file is being created. Um, so, and I mean, if the if the license is so, then it makes sense to to have that information. And fortunately, this is all not always true. So there are fonts around that ha that sets this flag, don't embed me, while uh, they they only mistakenly do so. Uh, so the the license, in fact, does allow for embedding. And unfortunately, it's also the other way around. So this is also. A, uh, case uh, um, uh, a root cause of problems. And then we have the not def uh, character, which is always on GID zero, and then in PDF that is also important to understand. In PDF, uh, not in true type, but in PDF, um, a true type can be specified as being symbolic or not symbolic. And non-symbolic means it merely uh, has regular characters, A, B, C, D, and so forth. And if in symbolic font has, um, yeah, it's windings or uh, tzapf dingbats and so forth. So not real char characters, but rather symbols, therefore symbolic. And then the provisions for these two kinds of two type fonts are different uh, in PDFA. So that, that is um, most of what I wanted to talk about for fonts and encoding. Um, there is one more topic in this area, and that is um, mapping to Unicode. Um, so Unicode is important when it comes to, um, to search for text or to copy text out of a PDF file. So all of what we have heard so far was only for displaying the glyphs on the screen, as you can see here. So, but that doesn't take care of uh, searching text. So, so far we, we don't understand, we, we have the, the outline of this S here, but we don't know that this is a character S. In order to do that, we need to map this outline to a Unicode code point. Unicode is, if you want, a, an ISO standard, a very long list of all characters uh, that are around on Earth. Um, so, and, and then, yeah, it, it, it says, okay, the, a, a character with a shape or a glyph with this shape is actually a small letter S and so forth. So you, you don't have to have that in a PDF file, not at all. It's useful, but it's not, not required by PDF. PDFA has conformance levels, conformance levels U and A, not the B conformance level, but U and A. They require that all text uh, can be mapped to Unicode. And this is uh, an, an, an excerpt from another pre-flight tool, which is called Inventory Report. Uh, and as you can see here in, in, at the top, we have the, the glyphs, 
the shapes, the outlines, and below the Unicode code points. Here are the numbers of the Unicode code points. Uh, and then here we can see this is actually a one, a two, and a three, and that is correct. And a bullet and an N dash. So these are the Unicode code points, the semantics to the, to the glyphs. And again, I mean, this is almost as complicated as what I have explained with regards to uh, encoding for the glyph shapes. Um, this again can, so the looking up of whether, what is the, the, the appropriate Unicode uh, semantics for a certain glyph uh, can take place in different ways. So it can be simply by uh, defining a standard encoding. So if I say MacRoman encoding, then I have uh, 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 already uh, the Unicode because I know the Unicode code points for all these uh, uh, um, characters in this encoding. So then I'm done. Uh, if I'm not using a standard encoding, then I can have in a two-type font a two-unicode CMAP. So as I've said, I could have various CMAPs in a two-type font. One might be a two-unicode CMAP. That could help here. Um, for type 1 fonts, if I have a glyph name, Adobe provides the glyph list, Adobe glyph lips list, and that also maps from uh, font na from glyph names to Unicode code points. And finally, I could as well have in the PDF part. So this to Unicode is in the font part, but I can as well have in the PDF part a to Unicode table. Okay. And as always, uh, if something is complicated, it also can get wrong. Uh, here is an example where uh, the pre-flight inventory reports reports actually something wrong. I don't know whether the report is wrong in this case or the font was wrong. Uh, but here the number sign, yeah, that is accurate. But here th that doesn't seem to be a dollar sign and neither does this seem, this seem to be a percent sign. Yeah, so here uh, something with a Unicode representation of the glyph obviously went wrong. Okay? So I hope that we kind of have answered most of the questions. So uh, uh, first question was what is a glyph? And the glyph actually is an outline or a shape that is associated with a character code and can then be displayed on screen. And a not deaf glyph is a kind of a fallback character that is used uh, when uh, the real, the good glyph, the right glyph couldn't be found in the font. We haven't touched on char set and CID set yet, so th therefore I have made this bold. I've said that identity H or identity V just is a, is a mapping table, but it basically what comes in comes out, so it's, it's a very easy mapping table. Um, font encoding, that is a complex thing that allows you, or that, that, that specifies how a glyph can be found uh, that, that matches a character code in the, in the page description. A CMAP is the encoding entry for CID fonts in a, in a PDF file with capital C and capital M and with lowercase c and m it's a structure in a two type font, an encoding entry over there. A differences array is a, a custom encoding uh, for um, true type fonts. And a type 2 CID font is um, a true type like structure for a double byte font, so for, for bigger font files with more than 256 glyphs. And a CID to GID map is a mapping table in type 2 CID fonts yeah, that you need in order to find the proper glyph. Which information is needed to uh, line one glyph after the other? And as you can see, the I here is much smaller than the N. So I need an information about the width of the glyph in order to place the next character 
uh, at the, at, in, in the right spot. Whether or not a font is symbolic is not important when you're looking at font objects in your file system or when you're looking at font objects in a PDF file that might be important. It's, it's a term that is coming from the PDF specification and encoding works differently for symbolic fonts as opposed to non-symbolic. And then how fonts are embedded into PDF, I mean simply by just getting the font file out of the file system, maybe stripping a few of the data structures that you don't need inside of a PDF file and then just basically copy the whole thing into the PDF file. So that is uh, the, the real technical stuff uh, that I wanted to explain when it comes, what, what's, what actually happens when text is being displayed in a PDF file and it actually is quite a lot. Um, and also when you, when you open a PDF file in Acrobat so, or in, in any other PDF viewer, you might see an error message like font cannot be extracted or something. And uh, this should be some, give some background about what, what actually might go, have gone wrong over there then. So now question, what is now different? So what has ISO 32000 S2 changed anything in this area? And actually there is just one major change um, and that is really related to the topic that we haven't covered yet. It's related to CID sets and char sets. And the easy explanation is it just has been deprecated. So and we have learned in the presentations beforehand, deprecated means if you create a file, uh, you should, shouldn't use that information, but you shouldn't, should definitely, uh, your application should definitely have any problems if it's still there. Uh, just briefly, a char set or a CID set, um, is just used for font subsets. So I, have, I haven't explained that. When you embed the font file into your PDF file, you can either embed the whole font with all its glyphs, or you say, okay, I'm using only three of the glyphs. I don't need all the other glyphs. So I create a subset of the font file uh, and only embed A, B, and C because I don't use any of the other characters. So that is a subset. And then in PDF, when, when PDF was invented, people thought it's a good idea to have in the PDF structure some information about which glyphs actually are present in a subset. So it might be good, for instance, for a PDF editor to know that this um, uh, font only has ABC. And therefore the char set and the CID set were invented. PDF A, requires them to be present and to be complete. Uh, so this, in fact, is a major problem for uh, PDF conversion and validation uh, because, as it turned out, once we started to implement PDFA, nobody really got it right. So all the char sets and CID set were basically wrong. Either there were wrong glyphs listed or not all the glyphs that were listed, they were present in the subset font. So it, it was a, a complete mess, but it also turned out since all the information is just wrong, nobody seems to use it. And uh, then uh, ISO wisely decided to um, just deprecate the whole thing uh, in ISO 32000-2. And the good thing for the PDFA users is uh, if um, or when PDFA 4 comes, uh, then this problem goes away. There are a few more uh, things that maybe need to be mentioned when it comes to PDF uh, to ISO 32000-2 versus 1, uh, but all of these are merely clarifications. So one example, ISO 32001 says two sets of widths the two sets of widths shall be identical. So that is, I mean, I, I, I've explained to you, I have the widths entry in the font and the widths entry in the PDF, but since both are 
using different coordinate systems with maybe different scaling, they usually aren't identical. So, and then uh, 32000-2, just more correctly says these which entries shall be consistent with the actual widths given in the font program. So these widths are the one in the PDF file. So it's it's much clearer. It really explains better what is actually meant to be said. But the in essence, uh, the intention of what uh, the authors wanted to say is the same. You have a, a difference for standard 14 fonts, where standard 14, I've given the names over here when, Post, when, when Postscript was invented, and also PDF, there was a, a, a intention that these fonts are always present in each and every output device, and therefore certain entries that you would need uh, if you don't have access to the font were not required. Um, since the situation has changed uh, since then, uh, I, uh, ISO 32000 says, okay, there aren't any exceptions, so whatever is mandatory for the other fonts is mandatory for these fonts as well. But as for some other um, uh, uh, deprecations, it also says that it recommends that PDF processors are prepared for the absence of these entries. And then there are some more clarifications for glyph paintings uh, and so forth, but many, many informative notes have been added just to, to make it more clear what, is, uh, what was the intention of uh, the written stuff. Uh, so the whole thing, I think, is much better to understand and much clearer, but in, in essence, the, the, the real thing uh, hasn't changed. So finally, um, some, some issues with uh, glyph selection. So uh, issues that we have encountered in support cases uh, most of the time. So one case, and I've mentioned that before, it's glyph lookup is uh, quite a complex thing and uh, something might uh, go wrong there. Uh, and um, uh, therefore, a font should provide a, a non, not deaf glyph that can then be displayed. So, um, having that said, um, of course, this is not what you want, what the creator of the PDF file had expected to happen. Happen. So, um, actually, for instance, you 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 had used a euro sign, uh, but when the PDF is being displayed on screen, another font is used because the font was not embedded, and this font is in a very old version. It doesn't have the euro sign. So then uh, uh, you have a missing glyph. Um, or a subset font is embedded, but not all. Uh, it, 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 while embedding it, it was stripped too much so that glyphs are, are actually not present in the embedded font. And this is how it looks then. So you can, instead of, I mean, this is a, a German business case, but you can easily see that some information is missing here. So instead of real text, um, you see these not deaf. Uh, glyphs uh, because the, the the viewer was not able to find uh, the correct glyph or any glyph associated with the character ID. And this is yeah, a somewhat funny example. Um, that was an advertisement. It's a long time ago. I don't know the company and I'm sure they, they do very good fonts right now. But they had this advertisement some time ago, we have something against expensive fonts. So that is what is written here. Wir haben etwas gegen teure Schriften in Germany. Uh, and then if you zoom into the, the advertisement, you can see that you have yet another case where we see some not deaf glyphs um, instead. So not nice in an, in an advertisement from this kind of company. And uh, another case, uh, a source of problems is, I have said um, the not deaf um, sign has to be used or is intended to be used as a fallback character, as we have seen in these examples. But some PDF creators 
don't follow this rule, they, in this case, we have on GID zero in a true type font, uh, where there is supposed to be the not def sign, somebody has, uh, is using this sign, this um, uh, ID for an actual character. Uh, and that, again, might create problems because uh, First, it's wrong to do so, and then a PDF processor might not be prepared to access this not def glyph for a regular character. It's not necessarily a problem, but it can easily be a problem. Another case, another problem that you can see is the glyph substitution. So encoding just doesn't work right. So the, the encoding mechanism finds a glyph, but it doesn't find the right one. Um, so either uh, the encoding uh, hasn't been properly specified. Uh, is it close? It's okay. Um, um, yeah, so and then it usually happens uh, then what you see is, I mean the, the, the base fonts, the ASCII font uh, uh, character set usually works fine, but then if you use German umlauts or diacritical characters, you might have problems. Uh, here is an example from what we Germans saw again a long time ago when we traveled to US. Um, and the custom service welcomed us with the US custom service heist, and that was supposed to be a German as set, but it's a paragraph sign, so something went wrong when this thing was uh, printed at that time. Um, and this is an advertisement again, and here, this was a case where it sometimes worked right, and in other cases, it didn't work right, so here, for whatever reason, uh, the N was uh, um, uh, replaced with a capital key in an advertisement. So why, why can that happen? Um, and then the source of this problem can be twofold. So one is the, simply the PDF is not right, then the encoding is not right, or uh, something is not properly encoded. Um, yeah, and I think in this case uh, um, uh, it was the not def character. So here the N was on the not def, and uh, the, some of the viewers were not um, prepared to use a not def character as a real character. But the same problem can actually also occur when a PDF file is completely correct. Uh, and that can happen if you have font subsets, maybe on various, on, on several pages, and each font subset has the same name. That means the PDF viewer would have to use the font resource for each of the pages in the PDF file, right? Because when each of the resources provides another font, then that font has to be used. Um, and even if the font name is the same in all of these cases, the PDF renderer, the PDF viewer always have to look for the right glyph. But for performance reasons, some viewers don't do so, so they just find, okay, there is, I have a font in my cache that with, a, with that name, so they don't use uh, the, 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 the new, uh, the, the font subset that is associated with the current page, they would use a font subset that was associated with the previous page. And that was actually a, a frequent problem when in, in, in PDF files in the print industry were um, created separately, pages, and then merged. And that means the creator of the single pages, usually they, they were using the same name for the font subsets for each of the pages. And that wasn't a problem as long as the pages live uh, by themselves. But if you then merge the pages to each other, then you merge font, font objects where all the font objects are having the same name. And that confused uh, uh, then the rips or, or the viewers. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I think I'm at the end. So what I wanted to cover is uh, some background information about font checks and PDFA and how the whole thing of font and text 
uh, font encoding, text lookup, uh, works in PDF. I wanted to cover changes in um, P uh, PDF and font encoding that were introduced in PDF.2.0. And I had uh, just shown you some examples of problems in PDF encoding. So thank you very much.